On this week's edition of New York Now, Democrats hold a virtual convention and Governor Cuomo speaks. This is a man-made threat by our own negligence. Cuomo is also publishing a new book. Bernadette Hogan from the New York Post is with me in studio. Jamal Bowman shocked the Democratic Party when he beat a 30-year congressman in this year's primary. He joins me this week to discuss. The state's finances are in the gutter. We'll speak with Assemblyman Ed Raw, a top-ranking Republican, for budget negotiations. And the deadline to fill out the census is coming up. Jeff Baylor from the U.S. Census Bureau has details. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass a legislation we'll pass a law that prohibiting it, it, and we will take them to the the court challenging it. another stand uh, for New York and sending a message to the nation. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Democrats rallied virtually this week to nominate former Vice President Joe Biden as the party's candidate for president. And one of those Democrats was Governor Andrew Cuomo, who delivered a pre-taped speech on the first night of the DNC. He spent a lot of those remarks criticizing the federal response to the COVID-19 crisis. And our current federal government is dysfunctional and incompetent. It couldn't fight off the virus. In fact, it didn't even see it coming. More on that in a few minutes, but first, back in Albany, lawmakers again called for a new investigation into the state's handling of nursing homes during COVID-19. They held a press conference on a new bill this week that would form a new commission to probe nursing homes. The legislature would form the commission and it would have the power to subpoena state officials and gather information. The goal here would be to prepare for a potential second wave of the virus. It's largely supported by Republicans, but some Democrats support the bill as well. We need everything, and the governor knows that, and this administration knows that. And, in, in, and instead of sharing all that information, and instead of being self-accountable, uh, I think they are more concerned about reducing any criticism into partisan attacks and blaming others instead of being fully accountable of what happened for the last five months. Bernadette Hogan was at that press conference and is with me now in studio. Bernadette, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So what did you think about this press conference? Because it seems like I've heard this story before. We want an independent probe of the nursing home stuff. Is this going anywhere? This bill that would establish a uh, commission to investigate this. Right. So there, of course, there's been pushes to have an independent review of how the Cuomo administration and the State Department of Health handled the COVID-19 crisis in nursing homes. And the, the governor's argument is that there's already been a review. Congress has done one. The state legislature also held two hearings on this. It's done. Also, the fact that the state health department produced a report which critics say this is an internal review of your own policies. Right. So it was interesting yesterday, though, because it was headed by Republicans, but then also Democrats. The bill is sponsored by Assemblyman Ron Kim, who's a Democrat, and he's been, you know, he's been an advocate of the nursing homes, et cetera, and their families throughout this entire thing. But the way what makes this different is that they want to create a commission, which the state has done multiple times Oh my God, before. they love creating commissions. Right. And the fact that there's no gubernatorial appointment on this commission, it would be headed by someone from the state attorney general's office, selected by the state attorney general's office, and then also members that are chosen by the majority and minority councils or um, conferences of both the Senate and the assembly. So we'll see. If I was a betting man, I would say it's not gonna pass, but you know, anything can happen. It's Albany. You never know, you yeah. never know, it depends. Let's move on to the governor's DNC speech. Um, mm -hmm. Well, first let's talk about his book. So mm -hmm. he announced this week that he's gonna publish a book. Uh, apparently he wrote it himself. I have not heard one nice thing about this book and I don't know if what you've seen. Right, so the governor hinted about this mm, a couple weeks ago and then Within the past couple of days, he said that we, we've seen it on online that there's going to be a book release in October. And critics have said, well, aren't we still in the middle of a pandemic? Why did you and where did you find the time to write this book? And the governor yesterday on the radio defended it. And he said, well, it's not a history of COVID. It's more or less lessons that were learned during the crisis. And then, of course, going forward. So he won't say how much of an advance he got, where the money's going to go. He did say a portion of it will get donated to a COVID-related entity. But he 
did not specify where. Yeah, really interesting to me that he is one who has advocated very uh, strongly for the president to reveal his tax returns publicly, mm -hmm. but is not willing to say how much money he's getting from this book. So right. we won't know that until April. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So really interesting to see that. His speech on Monday, I mean, we were all waiting for it in the LCA, the reporters in the Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this had the potential when we were first talking about it like a week ago to be like his father's 1984 speech, really like elevate his figure even more than it already was. But he only got five minutes, so I think that was a detriment to him. What did you think of the speech? Right, so well, the governor got five minutes, but five minutes compared to other speakers who got two to three. So the five minute allotment actually was a considerable amount of time, especially considering the governor has gotten a lot of notoriety with how he's handled the COVID-19 crisis, et cetera, the legacy of the daily press briefings you and I were both at. But the governor had been saying he was worried about getting compared to his father because his father had such a momentous and of course, you know, that, that speech people still talk about. Oh, yeah. So he said he was feeling pressure, and this is something that he does talk about quite a bit, being compared to the fa his father. But, you know, the speech really, from, from my point of view, it, it was a lot of what we've already seen and heard in the daily press briefings, just now it was shortened into five minutes. Yeah, I think like mm -hmm. from our perspective, because we watched him every day mm -hmm. for a hundred or so days, it was a lot of the same stuff that we've heard. Mm -hmm. But for people that are watching around the country, they didn't really, I think there was almost like an inside joke to it. He started out with, it's day 100 and X, uh, right. it's Monday. And that's all the stuff that he said at the briefings. Right, right. He, he made something, he was making uh, kind of like inside jokes that that if you were following it day to day like we were, then you would understand it. But then on a national scale, I don't know if people were getting confused. But And then he was also utilizing COVID-19 as a metaphor for the national picture and defeating Donald Trump as the Democrats are hoping to do. So that was also, that play on words is something that he's been talking about, but I don't know how that translated to a national audience. Me neither. I guess we'll have to find out. Mm -hmm. Bernadette Hogan from the New York Post, thanks so much. Thanks. We'll have a link to Cuomo's DNC speech on our website. Speaking of Democrats, Jamal Bowman made a huge splash in the Democratic Party this year when he won in the primary against Congressman Elliot Engel. Engel has represented parts of the New York City suburbs for more than three decades, but Bowman didn't think he was doing enough to serve the district. So he jumped in the race this year, and in June, he won big. He's part of a new wave of Democrats who are considered more progressive than a lot of the party. We spoke this week about that and his plans for Congress. Jamal Bowman, thanks so much for being on New York Now this week. We appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. So we had the DNC this week over in Wisconsin. We heard from a lot of Democrats from a lot of different parts of the party. I think it's fair to say that you represent a part of the party that's more progressive than others. And I'm wondering how you feel about the message that Democrats are trying to send to voters in this year's elections. You know, I think the voters are the ones sending the message. I mean, when you look at victories like mine over Elliot Engel, who's been in office for 31 years, uh, victories like Cori Bush uh, out there in Missouri, victories like Mondaire Jones, I think the voters are sending the message that we need to become a more progressive party and we need to meet the needs of the working class and the working poor in our country. And structural racism and inequality at this level is completely unacceptable. And it seems that Joe Biden and others are responding to that. I think the party has a healthy tension right now, and I think it's only going to get stronger and move us in the direction we need to go. You know, speaking of voters, you made a huge splash in June when you beat Elliot Engel in the primary. I'm wondering why you chose to run this year in a district that's been represented by a Democrat for decades. What was your motivation? You know, I've worked in public education for 20 years, uh, worked in Title I schools my entire career. These are schools that are underfunded and schools in under-resourced communities. And I was tired of our children being hurt and dying in the streets of the Bronx. And I just didn't see the leadership, and not just me, the people in the district. Before we even decided to run, we asked people about their representation, and they told us time and time again that it was time for a change, which is why we decided to get into this race. I want to ask you about education because, as you noted, you have a deep background in education. You founded a middle school. Um, you were the principal of that middle school, so you know the ins and outs of education. In New York State, even though we spend more than any other state on students per capita, we still mm -hmm. have this huge gap between low-income schools, high-income schools, just the quality of education all over the state. I imagine as somebody who has been uh, 
pardon the term, but in the trenches, in, in a school environment, you'd have some thoughts on how we could close that gap. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we spend a lot, but believe it or not, we need to spend more, uh, particularly in, in, in low income communities, because we still fund school schools based on uh, local property taxes and not based on student needs. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is we need to focus on early childhood education. We need to make sure our children and families grow up in a nurturing environment from birth to age eight. Uh, so that when they enter kindergarten at age th at age five, they are more prepared uh, to thrive within the school system. So that means early childhood education, uh, child care from birth to age three to make sure our kids are growing up in as nurturing environment as possible and ready to enter uh, kindergarten. Lastly, we need to integrate our schools. Our schools have been economically and racially segregated even since Brown first Board of Education, when we were supposed to desegregate the schools. We need to integrate our schools, and we need to focus on project-based learning in alignment with the needs of our current economy and the needs of our democracy. Uh, those are a few things that need to get done. Now, during the pandemic, obviously, it's an opportunity for us to be creative and innovative and think differently about how we approach school. We're pushing for more outdoor learning and experiential learning opportunities to make learning more hands-on for our kids. When kids get to get their hands dirty literally and create and innovate and build, they learn more at an accelerated rate. You know, your election has been compared over the past couple of months to when um, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez defeated Joe Crowley in that primary in her district. And But I have to imagine you have your own priorities, education being one of them. When you presumably enter office in January, what's at the top of your list? What I know that it's a big list, but I, I, what's your target, I guess? Mm. Housing as a human right. In our district, prior to the pandemic, we needed 70,000 affordable homes. We have four public housing uh, units, uh, areas, excuse me, in the Bronx that haven't received a dime from the federal government in over 10 years. Uh, housing is a human right. It is not a commodity. And we need to make sure we house everyone, not just in our district, but in our country. We need a Green New Deal in this moment, which provides a federal jobs guarantee labor jobs uh, that meet the federal minimum wage, as well as infrastructure, building new schools and housing and retrofitting them in alignment with the needs of a Green New Deal and growing the care economy, hiring more teachers, more nurses, more caregivers and more early childhood uh, educators. You know, Republicans, when they hear ideas like this, they say, great ideas, but it's going to cost a lot of money that we don't have in the revenue in New York State, in the United States. What do you say to them? Where does the money come from to pay for these things? We generate our own currency in this country, so we can generate the currency to invest in people. Listen, when we needed to bail out large corporations, big banks, the airline industry, and the cruise ship industry, we were able to find the money to do those things, right? So we need to find the money to provide a federal jobs guarantee, to build housing and create it as a human right, and to make sure everyone is employed in the care economy uh, within our country. All right, Jamal Bowman, soon to be representing the 16th Congressional District in New York State. Thanks so much for being on New York Now this week. Thank you so much. A pleasure being here. Moving on now to news about the state's finances. In the last four months, New York has collected $3 billion less in tax revenue than it did last year. That's a huge chunk of change. And there's not really a clear plan for filling that gap if the state doesn't get help from the federal government. Assemblyman Ed Ra is the top-ranking Republican on the Ways and Means Committee, which handles the state budget every year. We spoke earlier this week. Assemblyman Ed Ra, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Anytime. So the state is facing a $14 billion budget deficit. It's not looking great right now. You are the highest ranking Republican on the Ways and Means Committee in the Assembly, which typically deals with budget negotiations. In your opinion, as somebody who has had a hand in this for, you know, one of the most stressful financial years of the state, what do you think the state should be doing right now to avoid that big budget deficit that we're facing? Well, I, I think we all know the elephant in the room has been and what's going on with the federal government. Uh, you know, what type of aid uh, may or may not be coming. Obviously, things are not looking good in that regard. Maybe earlier in the 
in the month or the end of July, we I think felt a little more confident with that. So, um, you know, I, I think that the administration now they're talking about putting out um, some level of cuts, perhaps in September. I think um, I think more tr transparency would help. Um, you know, if we look at the difference between the approach to uh, COVID and the daily briefings and everything else versus uh, kind of the regular updates of uh, on the budgetary side, that would be helpful because we know a lot of local governments, a lot of school districts uh, are are very worried right now. Um, local governments have dealt with, uh, you know, withholding of aid. Uh, school districts are waiting to see what's going to be as they try to put forth their plans to reopen. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, you know, a little bit of a push and pull of wanting certainty, uh, but on this at the same time, uh, we don't want to go and, you know, come out with big cuts if, if we do uh, end up getting some, some good uh, amount of aid from the federal government that'll help alleviate some of that uh, deficit. Is there a third option here at all? I mean, we're looking at federal aid coming from the state, and then we're looking at spending cuts. And, you know, if we're not getting the federal aid, we have to do the spending cuts, vice versa. Is there a third option here? I think that people, it's like we're being stuck between a rock and a hard place, and people just don't know what to look forward to. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, in, in a really significant uh you know, an announcement, both the majorities, uh, you know, on the Democratic side have now really opened the door to talking about tax increases. Uh, I know the governor has uh, poured some cold water on that. Um, and a lot a lot of the reasons he cited are, are ones that I think, uh, you know, many in our conference would agree with. Um, you know, we do still have a pretty high ta tax burden as a state uh, when you combine, especially in New York City, some of the local taxes. Um, it really kind of puts that uh, near the top. So, so we're concerned with that. We're concerned with if we were to do tax increases, um, what the long-term impact on, on our tax base is. Um, we do have uh, you know, some really high level of reliance on our personal income tax base. Um, and you know, those short-term fixes uh, you know, may be very attractive uh, right now, and particularly taxing uh, high earners. But they could further erode uh, that, that tax base as we get into uh, into the years into the future. Um, I know there's you know any number of proposals out there though, both you know in terms of, of income tax and, and other type of taxes that have been proposed. And, and I'm sure um, as we get into potentially having you know major cuts uh, announced, there there are going to be uh, major conversations about those. So in other words, when we're talking about tax raises for the ultra wealthy, for billionaires, it's something that Democrats are pushing. You're right. Um, the concern is that if you raise taxes on these high income earners, that they might move from New York to somewhere like Connecticut with lower taxes and they won't have a problem getting back into the state for whatever they need to do in New York City. Is that the concern that, that I'm looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think we've already seen, um, you know, over the last really decade, uh, you know, our, our tax base eroding with regard to that you know uh, we have we do have a smaller share of uh, those high in income earners than, than we have in the past um, and I think that like I said something that is very attractive in the short term uh, may end up uh, just kicking the can down the road and and us still having to find ways to uh, you know deal with the things that we want to be able to, to fund like education and higher education and health care as we get into the, the years to come, uh, because I think we all know this is going to be a multi-year recovery from uh, from this situation. So you're more familiar with the state's budgeting process than most lawmakers, I would say. You're really in the weeds on it around March and April when the budget is really coming together. Can you kind of lay out what a $14 billion deficit looks like for the state budget? Sure, well, you know, I think for, for people to be aware of, you know, the, the largest portions of our state budget by far um, is number one health care uh, and then and then education so obviously those areas uh, are areas that nobody wants to see uh, cut nobody wants to see them on the chopping block um, but it gets to be very difficult when you're looking at numbers of that size um, to, to figure out how to how to spare things like that we already in the enacted budget did uh, reduce the state support for education uh, by almost $1.2 billion, which is being backfilled by uh, some CARES Act uh, federal funding. You don't know whether that's gonna be able to be backfilled with federal funds uh, going to the future. So, I mean, right there, just to get back the hole, uh, you, you know, we would need 
that state support. All right, well, we will be watching it with a close eye, as I'm sure you will too. Assemblyman Ed Roth, thanks so much for being here this week. Thank you very much for having me. Hope you're well. As of this week, about 40% of households in New York still hadn't filled out this year's census, and the deadline is coming up. The census isn't just another survey to fill out. It determines really important things, like federal funding for education and health care and seats in Congress. So why aren't people filling out the census? I spoke with Jeff Baylor, the New York Regional Director of the U.S. Census Bureau. Jeff Baylor from the Census Bureau, thanks so much for being here this week. Uh, it's a pleasure speaking with you. We have a few weeks left for people to fill out the census. That's the good news. The bad news is that in New York, we have about a third of the state that has not filled out the census yet. Obviously, that's not where we want to be, but give me some context. How does this compare to what we saw in 2010 at about this time? I know the year is obviously very different, but let's compare it to a decade ago. Yeah, we are a few percentage points behind as of right now. Um, I think New York as a state ended up at 64.6% self-response rate at the end of the 2010 census. Also included in that uh, percentage that hasn't responded are vacant homes, seasonal homes, second homes, uh, which, which typically people don't think they need to respond to the census for their second homes, but they do. And we'll basically, when we knock on doors or talk to a neighbor, we'll find out that it's a second home and no one usually lives or stays there. So do we know why less people are filling out the census this year? I don't think that we're far behind the 64% in self-response from a decade ago, but it seems to me being in the middle of a pandemic, everybody's home, I figured the response rates would be up, not down. Do we know what's happening here? Yeah, yeah I can tell you from, from a national perspective, we're doing better than we thought we would going into the 2020 census. And that's before we knew anything about COVID. Kind of the, the, the tough news piece has been we have partners throughout the state of New York who are planning really cool events, you know, in the hardest to count communities. And unfortunately, COVID hit New York at the time the census data collection was starting. And all of our partners, unfortunately, had to cancel these wonderful plans that they had put in place March through through July um, to help people respond to the census. So where are those hard to count areas? Where, where are we looking at? And I guess, it, it, does that correlate to where it's not being filled out currently? Um, where do you see the most difficult or the lowest response rates? And where is it hardest to get people to fill it out? Yeah, it's, it, and they do correlate with one another. Typically, the, the, the characteristics of communities that are hard to count, typically minority communities, communities where there may be a language barrier, communities of new immigrants, an additional challenge, especially for a lot of our, our uh, cities and towns in upstate New York, when you look at um, colleges and those off-campus students, many of them left before they ever got their invitation in, mail, in the mail. We need those college students to fill out the census as if they were still living at that off-campus apartment. You know, you mentioned immigrants, and a few years ago, I know the federal government had tried to ask about citizenship on the census. The Supreme Court essentially blocked that, said no, but there was a fear at the time that just having the proposal out there would drive some immigrants to choose not to fill out the census and not participate. Are we seeing that? Do we know? I, I don't know if there's a way for you to even tell, but are we seeing that immigrants are filling out the, the census forms at the rate that they would have 10 years ago? Yeah, we certainly have heard from partners that that's a concern that they have of their community members, that people may be scared. And that's why our partners, are, our, our trusted voices are so important in delivering the message to those communities, to let them know it's safe. That first off, we don't ask citizenship status on the 2020 census, and the data we collect can never be shared with anyone at any time for any reason at the person or household level. So we can't share their individual data with anyone not, not local, state, or federal law enforcement agencies, not IRS or Homeland Security or ICE, not local housing authorities. Uh, so our, our, th these trusted voices are sharing that message. And then the other piece of that message is really talking about what's at stake for their community for the next 10 years. When we talk about the hundreds of billions of dollars of federal funding for programs like uh, food stamps and TANF and WIC and Medicare and Medicaid to improving infrastructure in our communities, the roads, the bridges, the tunnels, the mass transit systems, parks, from education for our kids, from national school lunch and breakfast programs, supplies, classroom sizes, Pell Grants, uh, Head Start, and finally, healthcare. I can't think of a more important reason to, to take the five minutes to complete your census but than to support your local healthcare system.
because the funding they receive for hospital beds, for supplies, for the number of hospitals in, in your community, for emergency service personnel, fire trucks and police departments are all based upon formulas that use census data. So this is really our once a decade opportunity uh, to ensure we get a complete and accurate count of everyone who's living in the United States. All right, Jeff Baylor from uh, the U.S. Census Bureau, the New York Regional Director. I hope we can get more people to fill out the census in the next couple of weeks. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for the conversation. I appreciate it. If you haven't filled out the census, we'll have some information on how to do that on our website. That's at nynow.org. And follow us on social media at nynow underscore PBS. Until then, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.